That was my impression of Corvatana from the first game. It's very subtle. Pay close attention. I'm going to do it one more time. Humongous shame that you can't actually wear this. It, oh my god, it's such a cool mask. If you guys want to see me unbox this bad boy along with plenty of the other content that came with the collector's edition of Dishonored 2, then please check out my channel. Anyways, let's move on from the unboxing and the foreplay of gameplay videos, unboxing videos, talking about the game on Twitter, blah blah blah. By the way, follow me on Twitter. <laughs> let's go ahead and finally review Dishonored 2, one of the highly anticipated games of the fall 2016 season and definitely one of the most anticipated games for me of this year ever since it was announced last year because Dishonored 1 was a humongous surprise for me. I went into it kind of skeptical because me and Stealth Games, we don't always get along. Sometimes we do, sometimes we, you know, we fondle, you know, we have a good time, we have a beer here and there, but ever so often. He pisses me the fuck off. But what I ended up loving about the first Dishonored after I played it was that it really did stress the idea of freedom. Even though its emphasis was on stealth, it didn't necessarily punish you for not playing in the stealth way. It also allowed you to play it in a very visceral way where you get to kill everybody, but you're going to have to reap what you sow in terms of ending up with a bad ending or a good ending depending on how many people you killed. How did you eliminate your foes? How did you approach certain situations? And fortunately, the same type of nature Nature was carried over to Dishonored 2, brought to us by Bethesda the publisher, but Arcane Studios the developer. And in this one we find Emily Caldwin, who was a little girl in the first one, now grown up to be the empress of Dunwall here in the sequel, only to have a nefarious but very supernatural being kind of come into, just burst through the doors and be like, yo bitch, I'm here. Give me what is mine. So now that you've been robbed of the throne, it's up to either Corval Tano or Emily Caldwin to take back what is rightfully theirs. And right off the bat, you can tell that there's a humongous difference between this game and the first. In the first one, it was just Corval Tano, he was the silent protagonist, and you were trying to figure out who exactly killed the Empress, spoiler-ish, while at the same time clearing your name of said murder in order to restore peace back to the city of Dunwall. Here, you get to either play as Corval Tano or the newcomer, Emily Caldwin, when in said journey and while that is in my opinion one of the biggest detriments of the this game is that the story is kind of weak mainly because it's almost at least to me a legitimate carbon copy of the first game as it can continued to unfold it started to follow the same beats and paths as the original game it starts off with a series of murders you're framed for said murders so when you're kind of booted out it's up to you to clear your name whether you're Corvatano or Emily Caldwin and the game doesn't necessarily get any deeper than that except with a couple little mysteries surrounding some supporting characters whether they be new or returning from the first game not going to get mentioned too much but there's some details about these characters that are un revealed or unveiled in this game that are legitimately interesting it's just that the overall narrative of the story not necessarily that unique in fact there's certain it, this stretches over to the actual mission structure of the of the campaign you go from area to area being driven to these locations by you guess it's somebody driving around, uh, driving you around in a boat. Just like in the first one, so there's a boatman, or in this case, boat woman, and they take you to these different parts to uh, for you to accomplish your missions. And then once you're done, you go back to a certain location, you convey with your allies, then you set back out to the next mission. Same rinse and repeat type nature to that structure, except the actual missions are different. But I'll get to that later. I just wish that the story was a little deeper instead of feeling like a replicate of the first one. With that being said, the environment still stands out to me. I love this universe of Dishonored from the city streets of Dunwall to the shores of Karnaka that you get to explore in the sequel. It's very vibrant, it's very beautiful and lush while at the same time having like this canvas painting type of cinematography to the environment whether it's night or day. Exploring these environments is always a blast especially when you kind of rummage through some of the things like there's certain rooms that have paintings in them or books or shelves or stuff like that. Things, in, Little things in the background that really does flesh out the lore behind this alternate universe that takes place in the 1800s but it's kind of like a mixture of London and the United States different I don't know but just this world that Bethesda and Arcane Studios have created.
is definitely the one that I would love to revisit. And I enjoyed it in the first game. Here, it's fleshed out even more with certain hints at other environments that you don't necessarily visit in this game. But man, oh man, would I love to visit them in either Dishonored 3 or an expansion of some kind that I'm actually willing to put money on if I d do get to go to some places. Except for one. There's an environment that you see on the map. It's called Culero. For my Spanish-speaking followers, you know what that means, and that's that's terrible. And the characters from some of the people that belong in the story, as well as some, some of the basic NPCs that have some random conversations with one another, even some of the henchmen that have simple little one-liners to spit at each other that are genuinely funny or genuinely intriguing, they're very colorful, not only in their de design, but also the way they talk, the way they move about this environment. You still find like a homeless man hanging around in the streets and they interact with you, exploring this area and interacting with everybody it really does it really does give you the incentive to want to hit that square button or x or whatever you're playing this on and actually talk to somebody even if it's just like one line that one line can have so much character behind it but speaking of lines that's a perfect segue to my other major problem i only have two two major problems with this game one was the one that i already mentioned the story feeling like a duplicate of the first the second would have to be a little a bit of the voice acting. The actual voice talents aren't that bad. They fit all their characters very well, especially when you find out that Corvatano actually speaks in this game. He was a mute in the first one, and they actually made him talk in the sequel, which is a definite step up. But I don't know if it's just me, but some of the line reading was a little too fast. Like, I don't know, there was just this improper sense of pacing that... Certain scenes are supposed to be a little bit dramatic, they're supposed to have a little bit of weight to them, and yet they're rushing through their lines so fast that they just go by way too quickly, and you don't get to absorb that dramatic tension between two characters, because you can tell that none of these people were probably in the same area, they weren't interacting with one another, they just went to their booth, read their lines, and they just got out. There's a legend in the Tower Guard. Empress's last resort, a safe room inside your chambers holding enough gold to buy a good sized island. They say that this ring is one of the only two keys to exist. And after beating the game, reading through that cast list, there might be some, some found evidence behind this because you'll be surprised by the amount of people, the b amount of A listers that are actually in this game. I'm not going to spoil who's who, but it's definitely fun and interesting to learn who was who once you do beat the game and you'll find out that oh my god they were in this game this entire time but at the same time it kind of makes sense because maybe some of these people have different s scheduling conflicts so maybe they came in they got their lines done in like just one day and they walked right out because some line reading in this game is kind of bad but what i took away from dishonor one that made me like that game more than i was expecting it to was exactly what made me fall in love with dishonor 2 because the gameplay Oh my god, it's so easy to overlook the very rushed line reading or the unoriginal story with this gameplay. Because just like in the first one, like I mentioned at the beginning of the review, it carries over that same exact uh, uh, characteristic about Dishonored that I don't find in other stealth games, which is that you can play however you want. <laughs> it's, 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 what is happening? I'm going to go ahead and try to see if I can carry this with me as long as possible and... Wait, can I drop? I'd rather have the head, it's much more comedic. It's like, oh no, my head is deporting my body. But it's up to you to decide how you want to play, considering some of the decisions and some of the repercussions you might have to face when it comes to either the enemies that you interact with or the environment that you're in, whether or not you go with a high level of chaos by the end of the game or a low level of chaos where you don't exactly kill anybody but you try your best to just knock people off conscious or just not get detected at all. And I've seen some critics say that this is a game that demands to be played again and again and sometimes you find that in billboards or the back of some, DV uh, some of the game box to kind of get you to buy the game because obviously if a critic says something grand and something big and glowing about a game they're gonna slap it on the box and be like oh my god it's amazing buy this this is actually true for dishonor 2 because you can definitely find a numerous amount of combinations to try to play this game whether it be as either emily or Corvo Tano, and then after you choose your character, are you going to kill everybody or try to sneak by them without killing a single person? Or you do get detected, but you're just going to knock them out and try to figure alternate ways to get to your goal. 
because as you progress through each and every single one of these nine missions, you're going to find different ways to kind of execute your plan, whether it be going through a secret passage or going over the rooftops instead of getting inside of the building. It's just numerous ways. There's numerous ways to play this game. And on top of the, on top of the fact that you get to play as two characters, it just boggles my mind. And yes, I will be playing this game a second time. It's not any time soon because I want to play some other games before the end of the year to kind of make my list of top five games. But so far, you can definitely bet that Dishonored 2 will make, uh, make it on top of that list because the way I was able to play the game, which I should mention, I played as Emily Caldwin. Did not get to play as Corvo Tunnel because I have to get this review underway, but I played as Emily and some of her powers... Or, and some of the gameplay mechanics behind Emily are very similar to how Corvo's were in the first game where you get to go around it's from a first person perspective, you have your gun, you have your knife, you have all these basic ways of fighting in combat whether it be with swordplay or with your crossbow arrows or, or your guns or if you choose not to fight at all, sneak past them and use stealth as best as possible. But as you progress you're bestowed these powers by the mysterious outsider. It's turned into a Kojima game all of a sudden. Oh, accept the outsider's mark. Re reject the offer. No powers mode. Interesting. For those of you who want a little bit of a challenge, as the that you can reject the offer to get the powers, and the game is just solely based on weapons and stealth and your own, your own uh, technical prowess. And these powers are just a little bit of a crutch, but the game then progressively gets harder. So even you you have to think carefully about which powers you're going to have and which powers you're going to upgrade as you progress in this game and you gather runes, bone charms to kind of apply some attributes to your character. And yes, some of uh, Emily's powers are very reminiscent of Corvo's, like the blink, it's, uh, here it's called Far Reach, but it's the same exact premise, as well as the uh, X-ray vision, I can't remember how it's called, but you get to see through walls and see where enemies are for a temporary amount of time. But being this is a brand new character, there's going to be some brand new powers. And these new powers, I had the experience of using them the same way I was playing as Corvo for the first time in the ver first game where I was discovering these brand new powers, unlocking them with the runes and just using them to the best of my ability to try to get through these uh, enemies but the way I wanted them to play and that's how Dishonored 2 plays that exact same way only here not only do we have a new level of polish with the way that the game plays technically from a from both a presentational level but also from a gameplay level because some of these environments are going to fight back they're going to get smart because you you don't just have to worry about some of the enemies catching on to you and being like oh my god we discovered a body because in the first game if i could remember correctly i might be completely wrong but i don't think they discover your bodies here they made some tweaks to make the ai just a little bit smarter no. I'm sure. I'll check around here. You, you son of are you kidding me? It definitely antes up the challenge. Not only with the enemies that you face, but also some of the environments that you're in. The clockwork mansion. Oh my god. Definitely a standout for one of the best segments of a video game in recent memory. Oh my god. I spent like two almost three hours on that mission alone. But as frustrating as it became, it was like a good frustrating where, man, this thing is like a puzzle, but the way it's, the walls are, oh my god, you have to see it to believe it. Or better yet, you have to play it to believe it. And even though that's the standout, I'll give the honorable mention to another segment in the game later on that I'm not going to mention because it's a little bit of a spoiler, but let's just say it introduces a mechanic that I was just not expecting, and it was very, very fun to play. It was a little easy but still very fun to use in this environment. And much like in the first Dishonored, there's also some little side things to do, even though they're not side quests because the game's supposed to be a little bit more linear than that. You go from mission to mission to mission and you don't necessarily have an open sandbox to interact with, but you do have these large environments and there's bound to be NPCs here and there that are gonna be discussing amongst themselves or discussing with you about something else that's happening in that environment that could help you out in the long run that could lead to a possibility of getting getting to your goal a different way. So off, more often than not, if you come across an NPC and says, hey, there's this little thing that I want you to do for me, don't be quick to ignore it because it could end up helping you in the long run. Plus it gives you more content to do. But aside from those things, considering the fact that there's alternate ways to explore these environments and a second character to play them as, 
this game has more of its fair share of replayability, I can tell you that. So I will admit I was a little worried at the beginning for my first one or two hours of playing the game because the story was overly familiar, some of the line reading wasn't all that great, which are my main two gripes with the overall game, and I just felt like, even though I was liking the gameplay a lot, it just felt like some more Dishonored. But as I progressed, I got more powers, and I experienced some of these environments that challenged me with, uh, along with its, uh, its enemy variety that inhabited said environments that gave me a challenge and made me die more often than I thought I was going to. Oh my god, this game was a whole lot of fun to play. Only downside is that there's no mission select. Uh, in the first game, you can jump to various missions that you have already played. Here, you have to start from the very beginning. A little bit of a bummer, but considering the replayability, I'm willing to take the chance. So, I will go ahead and be giving Dishonor 2 a solid, firm, and golden, and stealthy. So yeah, Bethesda, Arcane Studios, Dishonored 3. Bring it on. Especially because of the way this game ended, there's a little, little thing in there that I can definitely see them hinting at a potential premise for Dishonored 3. And if it is, I am all for it because that premise actually would actually lend to a different story from this first and second game in the series and that's definitely welcome considering my slight gripes with the second second game so that does it for me let me know in the comments if you guys have played dishonor 2 what are your thoughts on it what were your favorite aspects about the game what was your favorite part that you're willing to replay the game for are you going to play the game all over again if you do already own it considering the replayability with the second character and the different ways to approach the game it's a very unique thing that bethesda and arcane studios have here and i'm hoping to revisit it again and also, in the comments, even though this is not related to Dishonored, please let me know what type of videos do you want to see from me from here in the future. It's just a random question that popped in my head, but recently I've been watching some self-help videos when it comes to YouTube and kind of growing my audience. And I want to use this opportunity to ask you guys, what do you want to see more of from me? I have asked this question before, and I will say that my most, uh, my most frequent response to the question was figure reviews. And all I'm going to say is that I do have a review coming up in the next week or two. And I'll say that my primal instincts are telling me that it's going to be a good review. <laughs> Anyways, be on the lookout for that. Let me know in the comments with your feedback. Like and share this video. And subscribe for your support. To, just to show your support. And if you want to see more from me, including that review, then please hit the subscribe button. Now, using this very convincing and not totally fake magic trick I will now disappear before your very eyes.